Hello, welcome to the BadgerCast. My name is Wasabi Boat Research, and today I'm talking with Mitch and Jonto uh, from the Badger team. Jonto, I, I guess this is like your, what, your third time on the podcast, so so you you need no introduction. But Mitch, welcome to the BadgerCast for the first time. Glad to glad to get you on. Do you want to just like give us uh, give us like a snapshot of what kind of stuff you're working on with Badger? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Mitch. Uh, I do came on originally as you know doing front end development, um, and now I do. Uh, I'm working mostly with the emissions side of things, so I'm building out the keepers uh, that handle our emissions and uh, set our cycles, building out automated processes to ha- handle those things, and then eventually working on the on chain emission side of things to make it like a truly decentralized emissions process. Jonto, did I neglect to uh, to give you an intro? You want to say hi? Any uh, any new Jonto news today? Hey, thanks. No, um, no, just uh, excited. We got IBBTC out. Um, got the big push out, so that's big. And you know, on to the next things. One of which is uh, zero. Getting pretty close to getting out there. So excited to talk about it. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about. Zero DAO, which is a, I don't know exactly what to call it, a sister project or an incubation project or an investment project of Badger that um, happened before I, I joined the core team. So I wasn't privy to all of the the like internal discussions and stuff. So I'm excited to just kind of jump into it because I understand that it's going to be quite a big improvement to the user experience, particularly when you're coming over with native Bitcoin. Uh, from from Bitcoin blockchain to the Ethereum blockchain. So what do you say? Let's get into it. Yeah, sounds good. All right, let's do it. So um, I guess the, the chapter one, we're going to talk about the problem that this solves. So let's say you're a user and you've got some Bitcoin and you're coming over and you're using the current Badger Bridge, which is a, a product of Badger DAO, which allows you to bridge your Bitcoin over into Ethereum. And if you've ever tried to use this um, or looked at the user guides, you can see that it takes, I don't know, what, four or five, six hours, depending on the state of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, to get the number of confirmations that is required to uh, successfully approve the transfer of the Bitcoin out and into uh, where it's going in Ethereum. So what... um, I don't know, Mitch, why don't, why don't we start with this? Like what, if you're used to using Ethereum, you see, you know, transactions going to go through in like 45 seconds or a couple minutes or maybe even like an hour if it's super slow. But what, what is it about the Bitcoin blockchain that makes it take, you know, multiple hours to, to get like a, a high confidence uh, confirmation of something? Well, they both uh, use proof of work to secure the blockchain. Um, it's just different algorithms that are used in the mining uh, difficulty uh that that is done for Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Uh, it's it's like a different mindset of what of what people envision security as. So technically, if you want to be really really pedantic about it, Bitcoin doesn't have any finality because if you uh, have enough you know computing power, you can reverse the blockchain and and make a chain that's longer and and have your truth. Um, but the general consensus is that after six confirmations, um, there is finality there because the cost of doing so and rolling back the blockchain after six confirmations is just, it's economically unfeasible to do. Um, so the reason that Bitcoin takes, you know, it's its upwards of an hour to get to six confirmations um, is just, uh, you know, the speed of how fast blocks are mined and the amount of proof of work that goes into doing so. All right. So one of the, the things that, we, you know, we try to talk about, like from a, a user point of view, and maybe Jonto, you can address this, but like, you know, say I have some funds in my bank account and I've got Coinbase, you know, why would I want to use this bridge that could take a long time as opposed to like going on Coinbase or a centralized exchange and just buying some WBTC, which is like the ERC20 uh, Bitcoin kind of it's like the largest one on on ETH and just sending that to my Ethereum wallet. Why would I want to do this bridging from the Bitcoin blockchain as opposed to a, a centralized? Right. Yeah. The And that's not a necessarily invalid path if you have a um, Coinbase account. Um, definitely a few extra steps, um, especially if you're sitting 
if you value security and you're someone who values decentralization and don't want to store your Bitcoin on uh, Coinbase long term, you'd still have to deposit to Coinbase, which is going to take the six confirmations. So at least an hour to get to get um, onto Coinbase and then you can swap for WBTC and then withdraw to ETH. So that's a valid path. If you're already on Coinbase, then, you know, it's probably the, the cheaper, faster way is to just swap for WBTC and, and you can come out. But I think our general stance is thinking that, you know, the future will be decentralized um, and there will be a multi-chain future. And there's going to be uh, you know, user friction along that way. And that's kind of what Zero's focused on um, solving. So, you know, the, the stance being that starting uh, initially, it's focused at as Bitcoin holders holding Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain and then wanting to be able to use it uh, places that aren't the Bitcoin chain because there's nothing you can actually do with your Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain. So if you want to, you know, borrow against it or sell it, um, how do you do that in a decentralized way without having to, to use an intermediary? And that's, you know, this initial use case is focused on that. So um, through a series of loans and, and keepers and monitoring the transactions and um, some risk risk transfer and risk mitigation, uh, we have it so that you can actually do all of that quickly um, and safely uh, and actually take these actions without having to um, keep your assets on a centralized platform um, waiting to kind of make that move. Got it. So... From what I understand, uh, Zero Swap or, or Zero DAO is kind of built on top of the Ren Bridge, which is the the bridge that that the Badger Bridge is is based on. So, uh, I don't know, Mitch, do you want to give us like a uh, just kind of a, a thumbnail of how the the Ren Bridge works now currently when when something is uh, transferred from the BTC to ETH chains? Sure. So. Um... The way the Ren bridge works is there's a series of nodes that all hold like a portion of a private key. Um, and they are combined in a trustless manner uh, using this uh, secure multi-party computing algorithm, um, which, you know, basically you can do some um, math to get to the endpoint without anybody actually knowing what the other people's inputs are. Um, so you can get you know, a, a private key that's controlled by a series of nodes similar to like a multi-sig um, uh, that, that holds the Bitcoin. So what happens is, is that is used to um, generate a gateway address for a user to send their Bitcoin to. And the Ren VM monitors that. And then once that is done, it mints or has the transaction to mint um, your Ren BTC, which is like the wrapped version of Bitcoin on ethereum how many different uh i forget the word you use is it nodes or how many different parts of this key are there like that would be equivalent to like the the signers of the multi-sig um i believe so the gray core or the team runs a 10 node um system right now i don't have the exact numbers on hand but um i think there's something like uh, a couple hundred of the dark nodes that are running right now, um, which would be once the system gets fully decentralized because uh, it's still building out. Um, but once the system gets fully decentralized, there'll be shards that hold um, the private keys within that. So like subsets of those. Okay. And is this sort of the standard model for, for how these bridging solutions work? Like I've, I've read a little bit about ThorChain or, and some of the others, but are there other models out there for, for these bridging apps or is this, this it pretty much? Uh, a lot of them are different flavors on secure multi-party computing. Um, Ren wrote their own um, algorithm, which uh, they tout to be like the fastest and most secure, which, you know, a lot of people say about their own product, but um, uh, from reading, it's, it's a really good uh, product. Um, any swap, I believe does similar. I think they use Shamir secret sharing which is another uh, way to share um, portions of uh, the actual um, pieces of the private key. And then uh, other ones do it in like a more custodial fashion. Um, 
I'm not exactly sure how like things like any swap or things like that work, but I believe that since they're on um, Ethereum blockchains, they use like, or EVM blockchains, they use um, smart contracts to handle the minting and burning. Okay. And so, uh, John, too, you're, you're thinking about kind of like the economic angles of this and the incentives of, of the different parties. How do you think about the sort of risks or, or balance of risks that that happen when there's like a, a one of these bridge bridging transactions like what are the kind of economics at play here right so the, the bridge itself the risk is the key everything is a multi-sig when it comes down to it for these these bridging um bridging solutions you're sending bitcoin to a bitcoin address and then it sits there and then some asset is being minted on ethereum um that's you know ren btc in this case and then you can burn that ren btc and then it'll release bitcoin on the bitcoin chain um so it's really just you know multi six all the way down just as um mitch was saying you know managed by the the dark nodes um where we're trying to kind of fit in is you know take you know move everything forward when you're wanting to try to actually you know take an action on um on ethereum so you want to do a swap um we're looking at okay you kick off this initial uh, minting of Ren BTC. You've you've sent the transaction, and now where do the risks lie? So, if we're operating under the assumption that the bridging is safe, which we feel fairly confident um, it is, uh, Ren Bridge has been operating for a long time um, with a lot of Bitcoin going through it and currently in it. Um, and then, uh, if we're making that assumption. Uh, how do we, you know, how can we speed things up? Well, we can look at the Bitcoin uh, blockchain mempool and we can see the way that Ren, the Ren bridge works is you say, hey, I want to bridge one Bitcoin. Uh, it says, okay, here's a an address it generates for you to send the Bitcoin to. Um, once you send the Bitcoin to that address and it hits six confirmations, then you are credited with the Ren BTC that gets minted on Ethereum. So it's really just taking that arbitrary six confirmations and saying, okay, we, you know, Ren, the protocol is comfortable saying that um, transactions that hit six confirmations, it is willing to uh, treat as um, complete, as, as final. And like that's, you know, that's the risk that's laid in there where, um, where zero fits in and zero swap specifically is trying to be a little smarter around that risk management. So it's another layer on top, you know, we're not changing anything natively with Ren, but what we're saying is, okay, well, what can we do to speed up this whole process, but also not give undue, you know, have, have undue risk. So all of this has starts from um, pre-minted, Ren BTC deposits on Ethereum. So we have to have Ren BTC there that we are actually loaning out to do these transactions. Um, so you as a user come and say, I want to trade on Uniswap. I want to trade, um, you know, or Sushi Swap, I guess is what we're starting with. We say, I want to trade um, Bitcoin for USDC. Um, that transaction you tee up just like you would um, anywhere else. And basically, you it, treats it as if you already have the Ren BTC. But at this point that you're trying to do the transaction, you don't. You don't actually have the Ren BTC. So we kind of you allow you in the UI to tee up the transaction and then you kick off, hey, I want to actually do the swap. At that point, you're faced with like the Ren BTC deposit um, modal, uh, which says, hey, send the one Bitcoin to this Bitcoin address. We, uh, or Zero uh, monitors then the Bitcoin mempool and once your transaction hits the mempool on the on the Bitcoin side, uh, a, a the same amount of Ren BTC, so one BTC in this instance, um, one Ren BTC would be borrowed from that liquidity pool um, and then swapped on Uniswap for USDC. Now we can't just hand that USDC off to the user because they could walk away and then do what's called like replace by fee, where you just kind of send a Bitcoin transaction on the same nonce with a higher fee, and it kind of overruns the initial um, Bitcoin transaction. So it would be you know fairly gameable in that sense. But what we do is we actually leave that USDC in a programmatic escrow, so you can see that it's been the trade has been done, um, the assets are there, but then they get released once your um, 
actual Rin BTC gets minted, which is after that six confirmations um, hits. So what it boils down to is the risk the protocol is taking um, is that if the price movement between Bitcoin and USDC is dramatic in that time frame, um, let's say the transaction never moves, gets to six confirmations, it just gets stuck in the mempool for you know weeks. You know we have like a timeout period. Um, it you know they do the replace by fee, something like that, um, and it never actually hits six confirmations. Um, at that point, the uh, the Ren, the USDC that had been acquired in that transaction will be sold back into Ren BTC, and then uh, sent back to the pool. So the risk is really just in price movements during that time frame. So that if the Ren the USDC has to be liquidated um, to go back to the pool, there, if there's you know not enough um, at that point to um, rede- you know um, compensate the Ren BTC pool 100% of what uh, it came out of it initially. So that's where the risk is. But, you know, that's, you know, we liquidate within, you know, an hour and a half or something like that. So there's an hour and a half price risk. And then we also uh, require the uh, the entity that is proposing the transaction, like the, uh, the loan, to post a bond that uh, is used to cover any gap if um, there's a loss on the on, on the loan. So there's a lot kind of going in on in there, but basically, you know, to talk about the risks, um, the risk is really just the price risk because we have the liquidation. We sit on the native asset and uh, you know, liquidate it if the RAN BTC is never minted from the initial transaction. And then we also have another layer where we have like an underwriter, an underwriter um, that is involved in the um, whole mechanics that posts, um, you know, some small, I think it's like 10% bond that should more than cover any potential price risk um, in there as well, um, just in case that that isn't enough. And hopefully they are then incentivized to only put forth um, and fulfill loans that they think will um, be successful that are transactions that will eventually get confirmed and, you know, how they determine that's, you know, a TV thing, but um, I know it's a lot. There's a number of different kind of like layers of different risk components in there, but that's, you know, how we are addressing it and, um, you know, where we see, you know, the important kind of components to call out and, and build mechanisms to, uh, to solve. So if I had to just kind of sum it up in like a one sentence pitch, it would be you're sending Bitcoin to Ethereum blockchain and it takes a long time and, what what zero uh, swap does is sees this Bitcoin incoming uh, onto the Ethereum chain and then gives you the user a short term loan of whatever your output token is while that transaction is processing. Right? Is that kind of the nutshell here? Yeah, we zero provides short term loans collateralized by. Um, Bitcoin transaction yet to be fully confirmed uh, Bitcoin transactions, roughly. And I, I was a little bit um, confused just about about the holding period on ETH. So you said so. I, at first, I, I thought it would be like okay, you want um, you're sending BTC and then you want to get Ren BTC faster, but that's not quite what it is. It has to be some other like subsequent step on top of that why why is that important and then the the part that you mentioned about there's a this escrow holding period on the eth side so like are we just kind of replacing the weight on the btc side with the weight on the eth side or how how does that work with with the weighting yep and i th- think the the key point is that people want to do something with the bitcoin uh if you just want ren btc you know, why do you want Ren BTC? Uh, if it's just because you want to do some transaction with it, you know, days in the future, then just use the bridge, right? There, there, you don't need to. Because the thing is, there's a fee involved with using um, zero. So there's, you know, it, it goes to the people. You know, it's a, it's a loan, so you got to pay interest on that loan. So it's a fee that goes to the um, basically the people that are providing that Ren BTC on the pre-minted Ren BTC on the Ethereum side receive a, a, a fee for 
um, that loan being issued. So most people, when it's I'm sitting in Bitcoin on um, you know, in my hardware wallet, I want to sell it. I want to deposit to Badger, you know, things like that. And those are things that might have a time component where there's you know a couple different risks. One is you know the price moving, so I want to do a swap. I don't want to wait one hour to to do the swap. The price may change. I just want to lock in the price right now. So okay, let me use zero. I'll physically actually do the transaction and I can see the transaction happening on um, Ethereum. And then I see that I'm going to get this much USDC. I see my Bitcoin is in the mempool. Uh, maybe it's got picked up. Maybe it's at one confirmation now. Okay, I'm good. Um, the other thing is that you don't have to sit there and wait for it. You can do that, see that it's transacted, and then you can just walk away. Um, we have to hold on to it in the escrow to um, so that you can't kind of gain the system. There are, you know, this is kind of application number one. And you know, the, the big thing with zero DAO is kind of building out more of like a, an ecosystem of solutions. Um, and one of those, you know, the ones that we've been looking at is how we can actually release assets maybe in one or two confirmations. You still can't do it on zero. Um, but just like Mitch said, um, Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin finality are really probabilistic. And it's you know, even six confirmations is just kind of a, okay, it's not economically viable even at the largest Bitcoin transaction size to um, overrun or to kind of propose a new set of, uh, you know, a, a chain reorg past six confirmations. Like it's just economically infeasible to do so. Um, okay. I, I want to follow, I want to follow up on that. So um, I think Mitch said that, yeah, like six confirmations is considered like the economic barrier to, to basically be impossible to, to reverse. So, you know, it seems like zero has some kind of, math or that that thinks that you can be more sure before six right like you're you're so willing that for this interest fee you're gonna you know front some of the money uh maybe with you said like one or two so what is the like if you had to put a probability number on like zero like something just in the mempool one confirmation two confirmation does it just kind of go linear or is it exponentially more difficult to 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 um revert as you go with like each subsequent confirmation or how does that work and how does zero purport to have like higher confidence earlier in that in that curve well we we, we don't necessarily um we so and I'll, I'll touch on that with what we can do but we're still leaning on the six confirmations and then that's when we've released the assets that were transacted that were swapped um so we're still just saying okay you know, Ren has the six confirmations built in, meaning that it physically mints the Ren BTC after six confirmations, and that's built into the protocol. I don't know if it will ever change. Um, it, that's and it's just kind of a social standard. It's one that's been you know most exchanges are six confirmations. Most people just use it as a baseline for assuming Bitcoin is quote unquote final, even though it never fully technically is. Um, but it just becomes economically unviable to uh, reorg the chain intentionally, you know, past that many blocks. What what zero is is really just like a, a logical layer on top or in in, in between, um, you know, this whole mechanism. So one of the things we can do is we, what we consider final is when we release the funds to the user. Um, so when we release the USDC, that's when we're considering things final. Could we do that at four confirmations, five confirmations, three confirmations? Sure. Like it's, that's just a setting. Um, we are choosing right now to not release assets until the REN BTC itself is actually minted. And that means that's, that's the least risky for pool depositors, um, that are, that are depositing into zero and earning interest on their, on their REN BTC. Um, because the, it's like that's, you know, no takesy backsies at that point. Um, the What we can do with this logical layer, though, is, you know, one thing we've looked at is what we had been calling like smart finality. And this isn't going to be anything that'll be already out of the gate, but something we could still build out is releasing the funds or doing shifts where we release the um, funds to the user uh, at like one or two confirmations, um, which is a lot faster than six, but still 
not as fast as zero. Um, but we do that based on the size. So all, all of this is just economic trade-offs, right? So if I'm only shifting to Bitcoin, it's not economically viable for me to spend the money to reorg, uh, intentionally reorg the Bitcoin blockchain by one block. Um, like it's going to cost way more than, you know, $120,000 to do that. So we can take on that risk and charge a fee for doing it by actually releasing the REN BTC to people early if we just wanted to have faster REN BTC minting if that was something that was important to people. Um, so that's something that can be done. It's just not done out of the gate and definitely, you know, would be open to working with people that want to come, you know, contribute and talk to us in the, the Discord as we're kind of building out more products, get feedback on if that's, you know, a, a compelling thing people would, would want. And we can do the same thing on the swap side to release the USDC after two confirmations based on the size if it's a transaction under x amount um and then you know if it's a 50 million dollar swap well okay we should probably wait <laughs> a few more confirmations on that got it so so it's not saying we're going to give you this asset early it's saying you do this uh send the bitcoin and tell us the transaction that you want to do with it we will go ahead and do that transaction for you now but only release it to you after the six confirmations yeah, yeah, exactly. And that can be any, anything. It can be any action on any chain. Um, you know, there's Got it. cool things you can do once you start doing that. Like if, you know, we have our initial uh, you know, implement, implementations on Polygon. So it's like, okay, you can um, do your swap on Polygon and release it. And then, you know, we have this programmatic layer on top. So, you know, we could even like shift stuff to ETH or things like that. So we can kind of do this once you're kind of hopping between chains, we could do stuff and maybe optimize for, um, you know, gas fees on different chain gas fees and liquidity for when you're swapping, um, you know, take that into account, um, when figuring out like a swap path. So some interesting things there, but yeah, the, the, the baseline is really just the, um, the swap to start. Okay, I think I understand what's going on from for a user. So then you have this other party to the transaction, which is the, the LP provider on the Ethereum side. So walk me through like what are the, the economics of providing liquidity uh, to the to the pool? What's the kind of APY you can get, or you know what kind of uh, what kind of uh, numbers are we talking about to to be an LP to, to this? Sure, I mean the uh, yield will depend on volume through the protocol. Uh, we do have it currently structured where uh, we can have the assets when they are not being loaned out sit in a vault, um, a urine style vault, a, a badger style vault. So um, it'll be dependent chain to chain, I guess how we implement that. But ideally users can sit where they're earning mostly um, the, a, a decent um, portion of the the yield that's actually being earned on some um, Bitcoin native vault, so like a you know um, a Badger vault, or maybe it just holds IBBTC. But then what happens is as that REN BTC is is needed, it'll be extracted from that vault, loaned out for that um, you know one hour ish time frame, um, and then it's returned. And then I think the current fee is about like 0.1 or 0.2 percent um, that goes to it. it's about the same as like a uniswap transaction now those loans are very short so if we have a decent amount of flow and uh, there's um, good um, i guess uh, efficiency of the pool meaning that you know there's at the high points where there's a lot of demand for um, liquidity, we have enough to cover that, but not way too much more, then it could be a fairly high yield deposit. Um, we just have no way to project right now, you know, what types of uh, flow you will really get, um, you know, through it. So it has the potential to have fairly high yield. Um, we don't need the large amounts of deposits in it. So that'll, that's the other reason we wanted to have the um, option for it to, you know, assets to kind of sit in like sit in IBBTC or sit in some other form that will earn interest. And then this will be kind of a, um, you know, a layer on top that'll, you know, extract it and, um, 
you know, do the loan and then come back with some, some added yield. And then hopefully that'll be, you know, a nice, a nice bonus on top. So uh, we're, we're very interested to see how it kind of plays out in, in practice. It's going to be very volume driven. It's very different than like a, a standard lending protocol that has like these loans that people put in and take out for, you know, you know, open-ended amount of time. Got it. So if the LPs are earning 0.1 or 0.2%, what, what is the fee, by the way, for a user to, to take out one of these loans? Like how much of a how many basis points over the transaction fees? Like if you were just doing a straight Badger bridge? Yeah, I think we're looking at like a 0.3% total um, all in that'll go to the underwriter, the DAO, and um, the LP pool. So that's all configurable and it'll be configured and adjusted as we kind of um, launch and feel things out and maybe different modules have different different um, fees. It'll be kind of like how REN itself has been, you know, like once a quarter, they kind of adjust the fees. They're kind of tweaking it and kind of finding the right balance. So I think we'll launch with what we think is fairly reasonable and just kind of out of the box. Like, okay, people are pretty used to like a 0.3% fee. That's what you pay on SushiSwap. So we'll have a all in 0.3% fee and we'll see how that, see how that works and then um, adjust from there. What, what about the, so who is the underwriter? Like, is that a DAO that's like voting on this or is that a person that you contract out to or who, talk me, talk to me about that. Yeah. Out of the gate, it'll just be zero DAO itself. will be running the main keeper. It'll be doing, it'll run the underwriter. Um, in the future, it would be cool to have like chain analysis firms or DAOs or something like that um, act as underwriters, but out of the gate, it'll be kind of, it'll be a function of the DAO to start. Um, and then we will have, have a an, an initial whitelist on who can be an underwriter and who can be a keeper and it's something that we'll look to eventually to to open up um but we you know it's obviously a, a, an important function and we think it's better to just start with the system kind of um consolidated out of the out of the gate and then um hopefully open that up it, the baseline structure is on kind of an open peer-to-peer network so it, it's there um it, it's, it'll really just be limited by whitelist so we can open it up when it's ready um and would love to have other other participants and you know work on different ways to have different underwriters that can maybe have different specialties and things like that but that's you know when it's going to start out and be very small out of the gate as far as you know let's get some traction let's find you know where we fit in the market um, it'll make more sense just to have it all under uh, one umbrella. Cool. So, uh, Mitch, let's go to you. Like, I'm going to ask you every uh, developer's favorite question to get. So, like, where, where, how soon are we are looking at this? Uh, I know it's like soon trademark, but what's like, what's the current current state of development? Um. So right now, uh, we are in testing phase. So we have something deployed on the Polygon network that we're uh, working on. You know, working out kinks of like math and like fees. Because calculating the REN VM fee uh, that's taken out, uh, which is dynamic, is a little bit uh, complicated. So we just want to make sure that all the math is correct before we do anything and have anybody actually using the product. Um, so right now, there there is a product live, um, but it's in like a very early alpha phase. Um, hopefully, within the next few weeks, uh, we'll have something that'll be like wired up to a nice front end where people can go and, and do those things, and we'll. Uh, have some uh, early alpha or you know early beta phase uh, where it'll be like you know limited low transactions and um, you know not too much liquidity in the pool, um, so you can't really be like crushing anything and, and really getting hurt. Um, and then once once we have those things done and all the audits come through, um, then we'll uh, be comfortable releasing it to you know its full potential, I guess. Ideally, ideally, we'll have something in the you know middle of December um, for people to play around. Awesome, and I guess like it's almost like MIM replenishes, right? Like you can kind of control the risk by just saying how big the pool is at any time. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, essentially. I mean, the amount of volume that can go through it is going to be limited or a function of how much you know assets there are to loan out. So if we have limit the amount of assets, we can't really um, loan out too much. <laughs> Got it. So. What about uh, what about our glorious multi-chain future? Like, is this uh, is idea? This is just going to kind of be uh, BTC ETH, and I guess Polygon first, or what? What chains will this go to uh, ultimately? So it's a good question. Uh, we are proponents of the multi-chain future. Um, so anything that 
technically anything that's EVM compatible, we could launch to. Um, but it doesn't really make sense because as I said, you know, the amount of transaction volume is limited by the pooling. Um, so if we're fracturing onto a bunch of different chains, we would have to source liquidity on all those different chains, which isn't, you know, um, super capital efficient. Um, so the idea is that um, Polygon will be kind of like our test network um, and Ethereum and Arbitrum will likely be the two that we are focusing on um, in the near future. Um, once those get, uh, you know, tested and we are focused on building our modules, um, then uh, the world is really our oyster. Anything that is supported by RenVM um, that is an EVM compatible chain um, is something that we would be able to launch on uh, without really modifications to the protocol. And you're going, you're going direct, like if it's Arbitrum, it's going direct BTC to Arbitrum chain. There's no, not like a ETH step yep. in the middle. Nope, it would just be right to Arbitrum. Cool. All right, so let's talk about um, the DAO and, and the organization that, that y'all are building. So how, how are you guys structuring the DAO? What's the, what's when token? All you know, give us the DAO, uh, DAO rundown. Sure, yeah, the zero DAO. Uh, and we touched on some of this in the post leading up to the Badger. Um, the Badger transaction is, uh, you know, really kind of focused on, like I said, like the multi-chain future, um, building things to facilitate a you know, more user-friendly multi-chain future. And, you know, we've been working on this for, I mean, it'll be two years in January. So it's been a while since like the idea was originally hatched and, um, some people put together and, you know, actual code starting to get put down and we've gone through different iterations of it. And we were probably obviously like a bit early in it. Like there just, you know, weren't really that many chains back then. It was really just Bitcoin and ETH and then, you know, like BSC popped up and now you have, um, Solana and like you know, the, uh, the ecosystem, the landscape has changed dramatically. And now it seems like, okay, now there's a lot to work with, but, you know, as we found with Badger, like there's you know, no replacement for having an, an engaged um, community to build a team and to keep up with, you know, everything that's going on in the ecosystem and pushing something forward. You know, it's a, it's a small team at zero and, you know, we want an, an engaged community to help us, uh, you know, drive this thing forward and see what we want to build next. You know, Mitch kind of uh, alluded to it that, you know, we have, you know, zero swap. It's a very specific, thing but um it, the the underlying groundwork for it for it gives us um, a lot of tools to continue to build with to build other um, modules on and we can kind of expand and expand from there and we can find you know partners and we can you know have, find uh you know larger you know narratives and use cases um things like that but uh it, it's you know a lot better to do that with more people involved and with a strong community so you know we we are committed to getting a functional product out first before um looking to do any token distribution um if in the bip that was um you know approved that uh, initiated the the investment from badger into uh zero there is a token, you know, rough token distribution um, laid out and that's, you know, we're going to be sticking to that, obviously. So, you know, more information can be dug into there about, you know, who should be expecting, you know, where people should be expecting to see the token kind of pop up when it's ready. Um, we'll obviously be fairly vocal about it and say, hey, this is what's happening. Here's, you know, how it's being distributed. Here is what you can use it for out of the gate. Um, you know, and it's going to be, you know, governance driven token we want to get a strong community in there we want um people to come in that want to help us build build these tools and help drive this thing forward and like i said it's going to be very you know we want to be in the middle of you know this multi-chain future you know if anyone who has messed around with moving assets between different chains now if we want to get from phantom to avalanche to solana to bitcoin you know that's there's not a, like a one-stop shop right now. You have to know which bridges are good and which bridges support which assets. And is this like a wrapped asset? Is does the token um, retain the same contract address? Things like that. Like you have to know all this stuff when you're trying to move between these various chains. Um, 
And we're hoping that, you know, Moran, especially when it gets host to host out, there is, you know, some sort of a consolidation towards one solution for this. And then, you know, uh, zero can be a layer ready to go um, to fit in between and just make this a much better um, solution, you know, much, much better uh, experience for everybody, whether it's wanting to explicitly move between chains or it's, it's really just, I want to do some action. Like I want to sell Bitcoin or I want to sell some asset I have here for another asset. And I have an asset on this chain. So I have an asset that's in a location and I want to get another asset that is either at the same location or in a new location. And then what's the path to do that? Um, you have to take gas into account. You have to take confirmation times into account. Now that's stuff that all can technically be obfuscated away from the user. Um, and, you know, it'll obviously be, you know, a fee for, for doing so, but it can make, you know, for everything, it make everything a much better experience and ideally maybe even save, you know, save people money if it's, Hey, you can source liquidity on a lower cost chain and then, you know, deliver those assets somewhere else through a series of loans and, you know, having some, you know, general economic security in there. Um, you know, we think that's a fairly powerful thing. Um, but it's a kind of a, it's a big vision and it would be great to have people in the DAO contributing, you know, strong community, you know, contributing to help us kind of push these, you know, products forward and kind of make sure we're, we're putting our time and effort into the, you know, the right things. Got it. And Mitch, before we were uh, recording, you were telling me a little bit about some of the other kind of like 2.0 features that could be built onto this. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Like John said, um, the slop module is kind of like, it's like the simplest form of what you would want to do. Um, but with DeFi, you can get into um, some really cool things. You can take out a loan. Um, you can perform an action with the result of that loan. Um, you can get into leverage positions uh, instantly. Um, so for example, if you want to use leverage positions, um, say you want to get into a Bitcoin long, um, but you don't want to go into FTX and um, use a centralized exchange to do so. Um, you could do use zero to, um, if, if a module is built to support this, to go and deposit your Bitcoin onto DIDX and uh, use that to uh, take out a long on your Bitcoin on chain. Um, and you can get into that uh without having to wait for six confirmations. Um, in that time, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin can move pretty dramatically. Um, and if you're, you know, pretty convicted and you want to get into that long immediately, you could use um, something like zero uh, to do so. Uh, so there's, there's like kind of like the uh, different applications that can be built on top. So anything that you can do in DeFi, um, you can do with native assets uh, through the zero protocol. The other one that I think you mentioned before was uh, something that I really love about using the Avalanche bridge is where you bridge into Avalanche and then it gives you, you know, whatever you bridge plus like a little tip of AVAX tokens so that you can do your first one or two transactions. Like that's such a huge user experience boost and something that definitely has like prevented me from doing some bridges that I want to do. So I'm like, oh shit, I have to go buy some harmony token on some other random exchange and move it or whatever you know so if you could integrate that i think that would be like a huge kind of grease to the uh wheel of multi-chain yeah yeah we've discussed it in a number of different kind of fashions uh, we refer to it as a uh, gas as a service um but uh yeah essentially doing the bridge uh uh from bitcoin to say ethereum um if you're a bitcoin maxi and you don't want to hold ethereum you just do Bitcoin to Ethereum and do your, your thing. And then that gives you a small amount of Ethereum that would cover the cost of maybe a couple of transactions um, on Ethereum network, which, you know, if it's on Ethereum main chain might be a couple hundred bucks. Um, <laughs> but if it's on something like Polygon, it could give you, you know, a couple of dollars worth of, of Matic um, and you're on your way. Awesome. Well, so this is the Badger podcast. So why don't we get into the Badger angle a little bit? Jonto, you mentioned uh, a bit that that was passed earlier. Um, that was before I came on uh, full team full time and was, uh, you know, not not paying attention to every bit with the granular detail that I do today. So do you want to just kind of bring us up to speed on the initial kind of 
DAO to DAO agreement that took place and, and what the uh, kind of institutional connection between Badger and Zero DAO is? Sure. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can pull up the, find the BIP real quick. If I can put, use the appropriate name here. Okay, BIP 50. Um, so adding zero confirmation to the Badger DAO Annex. So the Badger DAO Annex is the incubator. Um, we haven't really been that active with it, but I think it's something that's still we're interested in doing more of. It just hasn't really, the right thing had, right things haven't kind of arisen yet. But um, the deal was roughly a million dollars, um, largely in um, basically 50-50 USDC and Badger. Um, with the Badger being locked for, I think, a year. And then the USDC was, you know, I think it was 450000 in USDC and then 50000 in Bitcoin um, at that time. And the 450000 for USDC has been, you know, basically operational funding to get us through, um, you know, getting it launched. And that's been very helpful. And we have, you know, uh, you know we have one uh, lead developer and then we have um, another developer who's been, uh, contributing a lot of time and then a couple other kind of um you know other people that have con- been contributing as as well but you know more more part time so it's helped us able to kind of ramp up the folks that are contributing to the protocol and to get this thing live um the trade off then was basically um roughly 25% of the tokens is to badger in some capacity 10% of that will be to the badger treasury and another 10% is going to be distributed to badger holders in some um, manner so we're working through kind of that structure now um for how exactly that would be is going to be accomplished and then there's 5% that was kind of originally set aside for um options for badger to potentially purchase more from zero in the future i think discussing with people now um there doesn't really seem to be much that really makes sense to build out a new structure for this whole options thing going forward so i think it's something we'll just engage with the rest of the rest of the badger core team and uh the community and figure out maybe there's more fun stuff we can do with that extra five percent to help push you know both projects forward so that was kind of the general breakdown um, of the token distribution. The exact mechanics are all still being worked out. Um, you know, are we going to do it on uh, mainnet or uh, Arbitrum for you know distributing the tokens initially? Uh, where do we want to have you know governance live? Things like that. Um, how are we going to you know source liquidity? Um, things like that around the launch. So um, that's kind of what we're focused on now, and I think. Um, you know, things are aligning pretty well timing wise with Badger pushing more on IBBTC and that, you know, maybe we, we integrate uh, IBBTC more heavily with, um, with zero, if that's going to be more available across different chains and not necessarily worry about this whole other like vault thing. Um, but that can be, you know, a nice utility as well as having, you know, non loaned out RenBTC sit in IB, IBBTC form. And then if there's uh, curve pools available for swapping, um, we can actually swap through those pools to have the, you know, Ren BTC for the loan um, each time. And that might be more efficient on some chains than others, depending on, you know, the cost of a curve transaction. So a lot of interesting things that we can do now that we're kind of getting to the point where we are looking at, um, you know, a, a more imminent launch, um, which would be, you know, get it, basically getting the, the product out there and having people able to actually use it. Um, and then getting the token in the hands of the folks and then having, you know, lighting up, uh, governance and kind of kicking off the next stage of the, uh, roadmap with, uh, you know, hopefully a, you know, thriving and engaged zero community. Um, um, and I can only hope and assume that'll be largely, uh, filled with, um, Badger community members as well. You know, that's kind of one of the things that really hoping to do is engage with the, the great Badger community and get, them helping um, us uh, drive zero forward. Awesome. So we talked a little bit about the DAO to DAO angle, and I'm just curious uh, now about like what are the what are the synergies with Badger in terms of just like integration. So like you talked about number one, like holding IBBTC as like that's a way to generate um, some yield on this Bitcoin that's sitting in the zero treasury. Are there any other direct integrations? Like, does this make sense? Like, if someone wants to go into a Badger pool, this helps them get there faster? Are there other kind of technical ways that Zero could help Badger users in the app going forward? Yeah, we could definitely have 
So like the IBBTC LP is the big focus right now, right? That's where most of the yield is. Um, we could 100% have it so people can just um, integrate with the, the bridge that people bridge and then they bridge right into that pool. Um, that is something we can do. Uh, there would be a fee associated with it. So the question is like, that is a purely convenience move. There's not necessarily, you're not necessarily worried about price risk or any, you know, in, in the amount of yield you're missing out on by depositing an hour later versus right now isn't significant. So the question is, is that something that people would want, you know, would, would want um, if it's, you know, might not be that hard of a thing to build. So maybe we just do it regardless. And that's a nice, you know, nice to have. It could make even more sense as we have more pools on uh, other chains. Let's say if we have IBBTC on Curve, on Arbitrum or on Polygon, and, um, you know, it's obviously cheaper to get into those. And let's say they have decent yield because we're, we've built our convex stack and we're able to kind of, uh, vote for them, um, to, to, to choose the, the yield on those pools. Maybe that's where it's easier than now to, and it makes more sense to have, okay, well, you're not paying much in gas anyway, so you don't mind paying the, uh, the, the fee for, um, the zero confirmation to, you know, get into that vault immediately. Um, so that's something that we can do. Maybe something that Badger subsidizes or something like that as well to say, hey, you know, we'll help subsidize part of the zero fee to um, get you in there so you don't have to pay a fee. Um, so there, I think there's you know, definitely there definitely different things we can do there. And then, you know, ba zero itself is more of a, you know, middleware protocol. We don't want, we're not trying to build something and say, hey, everyone come to zerodow.com and like, you know, use our app directly there. We're going to have the apps available, but they'll really be proof of concept. We want to integrate with different protocols. We want to, you know, be on Curve or on uh, Sushi or something where people go to to interact there and then it just uses zero in the background and same thing with Badger. So, you know, maybe um, if there's, uh, you know, leveraged BTC tokens that are available to swap into and people want to be able to do that with, you know, zero uh, confirmations and get in quickly, um, that's something we can facilitate and have that be available in the Badger app um, or build it out as, as an app and have that, you know, as a page somewhere. Um, so I think that's that's where it'll be interesting to kind of find those synergies and would love to engage with folks for what people would like to, to see. Um, and, you know, we can hopefully light some things up and um, get them out there and try them out. Because like I said, the, once the backend protocol is functioning, like, you know, launching new modules is... Um, much less work and that's where you know the more things that are available hopefully then the more flow that comes through the system it all uses the same uh, borrowing pools in the the back end so we can get higher yield for the um, the uh, the pool depositors well awesome this is this is really exciting and I can't uh, can't wait to, to see how it how it turns out when when the launch happens so you mentioned the Badger community, so so let's close with this. Like, if there are members of the Badger <clears throat> community that are listening, what what areas do you need help in? Are you looking for devs? Are you looking for uh, just people to hang out in the Discord? What 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 ways can the Badger community be of assistance uh, at this time? Yeah, uh, hop in the Discord. Um, Mitch, I just realized in zerodow.com, I don't know if we have a Discord link, um, so we should. Uh, <laughs> definitely check that out. Um, but uh, if not, you know, ping anyone in the Badger Discord, be able to point you in the right direction to get to the Zero Dow Discord. Um, you know, devs, obviously, always, um, always helpful. I'll let Mitch kind of touch on maybe what kind of devs we're looking for, which skill sets we're, we're in, the, in the most need of. Um, and then on the uh, other side, non-dev side of things, um, people that want to help with uh, marketing or memes, always great. Um, we are going to eventually try to have some utility for the token in the whole underwriting process. And that's something that I think is going to take a while to build out. But if people want to help us kind of, you know, noodle around on that mechanic and how that'll function long term, that would be great. Um, other people that just want to contribute by putting together content, um, helping with new ideas for new modules. Um, that would be great as well. Uh, making connections to new products, you know, existing products where we might fit in um, and work well with them, you know, definitely make the connection. I'm happy to do that. And like I said, you know, Mitch and I are full-time at 
Badger and kind of still contributing to zero. And we have a number of other people that are contributing to zero, but there's a lot of room for people to step up. You know, Mitch and I started as Badger community members first. Uh, we were just in the discord helping Badger out and then, you know, started contributing and then kept contributing and then joined the team. <laughs> and that's, you know, pretty much how everyone on, on the Badger team started. Uh, so, you know, hop in, uh, just do whatever you think can be helpful. Um, hit on the areas I just brought up. Keep an eye out on the on Twitter, on Discord, um, and you know, see where we're asking for help. And you know, that'll fill in and that'll adjust day to day, week to week. Um, but yeah, the more help, the more the merrier. And hopefully, we can you know find some great folks to work with and um, you know help us get over the hump to get to launch. And then you know, hopefully once we're launched and live, there's even more to do and contribute to. And, um, you know, we find more, more folks that way. So yeah, Mitch, I don't know. Um, are there any, uh, specific kind of developer focus call to actions, um, you want to call out? No, not really. I mean, like, uh, in general, what we run is, uh, similar to most web three shops is just a, uh, um, react app, um, for front end, um, which is flexible. We don't have to, you know, if we're building new applications, it doesn't need to be in React, um, but just some like generalized front end um, experience, uh, especially with Web3. If you're familiar with Web3, JS, or Ethers, um, those are really good things to know. Um, and then obviously, Solidity um, devs are always in need. So if you're a Solidity dev and you're interested in like the Bitcoin um, or na- non native assets trading on, um, Ethereum or being utilized on Ethereum, uh, hop in. I'm sure there'll be uh, plenty of stuff to do. And yeah, um, marketing, other people uh, that want to, you know, help form and shape the vision of where we go in the future. Uh, they're always welcome. Awesome. Mitch, Jonto, this has been really informative. Thanks for your time. Why don't you uh, hit us with that website one last time as we sign off? Uh, ZeroDAO.com. And then on Twitter, Twitter's probably the best spot. I think the link's there. ZeroDAOHQ. So Z-E-R-O-D-A-O-H-Q um, on Twitter. Um, hop in there. The Discord link is in there um, as well on the Twitter. So um, hit that up. Hop in. Say hey. All right, Mitch, Jonto, thanks so much and look forward to uh, to the launch. We are too. <laughs> yeah, yes, too. Very much so. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Wasabi. All right. Cheers, guys. Later.